A lot of times teachers who get into this begin to wonder how to set up their grade book. I mean, quite often they say differentiated instruction is nice, but the rubber hits the road when I have to report my grades. And I understand that. Now, reporting systems, you got to take a look at that. Are you standards based or not? And that's, that's one thing. A school district will have to deal with that. And we could talk about that if you'd like at some point. But grade books, that's every day to teachers. How do I do this in my, in my grade book? One of the things I wanted you to think about is, do you remember the old dark green and dark brown cover grade books that some teachers have, even today, but uh, us have? We would list the class roster, maybe on the, the vertical axis, and then the assignments would be across the top. I know a lot of electronic grade books that are currently set up like that. A lot of teachers use that. Well, that's two axes. But what we're asking teachers to do is to weave in the standards because these assignments were just vehicles for actually representing or manifesting the evidence of the standards. And grades go against standards, not the formats used to represent them. It's really important that we understand we're standards-based, we're criterion referenced, not norm referenced, not just against the assignments. Okay, that means that one of these axes, since we only have two axes until we get three-dimensional grade books, which might come, is going to have to go. And in its place is going to be standards. So what I like to suggest is most people get into this. Instead of like two pages and a hard copy dedicated to the class roster and so on, two pages or two sides, two halves, are dedicated to one student. So the student's name is at the top. But then across this axis, would be all the vehicles, the assessments, the assignments, whatever they are. And this axis would be the standards themselves. Or reverse it, it doesn't really matter. But let's say it's standards listed here. Maybe there's six standards. And over here are the assignments across the top. So then I have to decide, all right, XYZ test. That's the first test in my grade book, just as an example. XYZ test is right there. It only has three scores going down. There's six standards but only three of them have any kind of number next to it. That's because that's all that test actually assessed. So at the top of the test, if you really get into this, top of your quizzes, top of your projects, you actually list the outcomes, the standards, the objectives, everything, and they get a unique and separate score for each one. So there's no more ancient Greece test, 89%. No or B, or whatever it might be. It would be each of the objectives, and at the top of the test, it would say B, B plus, B, A, C plus, B. And one test created five or six grades, but the test would be recorded under each of the different standards. And it would only speak under, to, uh, for that particular criteria for that particular standards criteria when the test was recorded there. Well, it's fascinating because, think about it, teachers don't like to have blank squares in their grade books. We all think, oh no, the child was absent. I forgot to write absent in the little square. Oh, I lost his paper. Oh, now I have to call the parents and explain I lost the paper. No, no, no. The test didn't actually test those things. So we leave that square blank. If that really bothers a lot of people, put a smiley face in there or some kind of slash to it, whatever it might be. Now, when it comes to designing the grade, well, just like when you design your lessons, where do you always start when you start designing your differentiated lesson? With the standards or the outcomes, the intended benchmarks, whatever they might be. Well, it's exactly where you start when you're going to do your grade book moving into the report card. I start with the standard, let's say a standard 1.1, whatever that is, and I go across and I look at all the evidence, and it's the most consistent level of evidence over time. Mode and median or forms of central tendency, not the average. Whatever that is, I have a far column on the, the, the end of it there that indicates the most consistent level of performance for each one of the standards, and that's it. Then. On my report card, if it was a standards-based report card, in a perfect wish list world, I'd press a button and the standards would print out with just the individual scores for each standard. If I'm still in a school or school district that uh, requires just a single square for each, one, uh, for each general subject area, like math, and there's one square, there's not multiple squares for each of the standards in math, then I have to somehow take the most consistent level performance of all of those and put that in the square. One thing to think about, though, is what's well, kind of like Animal Farm, George Orwell. Some animals are more equal than others. Some standards are more equal than others. So quite often, we have to sit down together as a grade level or department-like team or subject-like uh, team and decide what are the 10 to 12 non-negotiable power standards. Our grades will represent this, if nothing else. Non-negotiable. 
What's secondary? We'll fill in kind of around that. And what's tertiary? We'll get to if we have time or, or maybe squeeze it in with some other discipline somehow. Well, some standards should weigh more heavily than other standards. They're more complex. As Doug Reeves likes to say, they provide more leverage for what's to come in the student's journey down the road. These are all factors in considering it. Well, on top of all this, as you look at your grade book, you want to be mindful of formative or summative. So I would suggest that you actually have a section of your grade book that's called formative. It'll be the larger section because there's more daily activities that are going to be recorded there under formative assessment. Then a, a dividing line. When I had the hard copy grade books, it was easy to just take a marker or a pencil and just draw there. But when we moved to electronic grade books, people got really mad at me when I would draw with marker on computer screens. Plus electronic material kept moving behind it. So that, that was a joke. But <laughs> understand that what I do is, uh, if I don't have a grade book that allows me to do that, I make up a fake assignment. It's called formative summative border. And I use a symbol that all the way down, that's not used as a letter grade anywhere else. So you can very clearly see the demarcation line. The symbol I like to use is the pi sign, because it's most like me. You know, irrational, and goes on and on forever. Then we have this section over here called summative. So we have formative and summative. And now we decide, does this side count a lot? No, it's formative. Does this side count a lot? It's summative. Yeah. So what's the teacher's ratio? This counts 10. This counts 90. This counts 5. This is 95. That's kind of my class. Is this 0 and this is 100? Is this 20? Is this 80? It helps you decide what the role is of everything you do when you have a gradebook set up as formative versus summative. It's something to consider.